Uh, I'll probably have a question on the quiz around virtual memory. Um, in my, I mean, a possible question, a, a, a kind, the kinds of questions I might put on are um, anything from taking different algorithms, like paging type algorithms, and deciding which one might be better for a certain situation and why, to um, taking different types of page level designs or asking you to come up with your own for a particular situation. I may also ask you to do something like take this virtual memory for OO systems and talk about how that, the performance, what you think the performance characteristics of something like that might be on a Unix style um, uh, paging, a virtual memory slash paging uh, memory management scheme. So just make sure you understand that stuff. If you have questions about that, you can ask me or you can ask the TAs. Um, but were there any other, any other issues there that people were unclear about last week that you want me to run through um, quickly before we start today? Okay, what is a distributed system? Um, well, again, there's lots of definitions. One of the definitions is it's one that looks to its users like an ordinary centralized system, but runs on multiple independent CPUs. Now, that's a very general, uh, general definition because something like that could actually cover, you know, uh, potentially a uh, multiprocessor, like a two or three CPU machine. Um, but more generally, what you're, the way I like to think of distributed systems are systems where you actually have these CPUs not all on one, uh, on one actual machine. So I like to look at the symptoms. Um, and here's a set of symptoms that Schroeder came up with. One is that the, the processing units, there's lots of them. They're independent. That's good. Second is that processors communicate via a hardware interconnect. Typically, that's the network. The processing unit failures are independent. This is important. If you think about uh, the processors out all this computation substructure on the on the out on the internet, one thing that you can't be sure of is that you're always going to be connected to a processor that's out there. And the second is that that processor is always going to be up. Uh, fourth thing is that there's a lot of resource sharing that has to be managed across this computational fabric. And the last is that there is state shared amongst all these processes. We had talked about some design issues before, um, more generally, uh, when, uh, when we were talking about systems. But once we start thinking about distributed systems, the design issues become more complicated and take on a different flavor. Um, these are important to, I'll, I'll go through each of them and describe them, but keep these in mind because these are going to add more complexity. And when you read, when you read papers and when you think about systems, these, this is a good framework to think about, well, what's important and what's not and what issues have they addressed and how have they addressed them. First one is scaling. So what type of scaling do we, do we mean here? Well, because things are distributed, the idea is that you want to be able to add more processing elements to it. And that would be a great way to scale a distributed system, right? If you can just add twice as many and it just performed as well as, as it did when it was, when it had half as many. Um, and so that, typically that's the type of scaling that you have to, that you have to look at. Second is communication. Communication we almost took for granted, uh, before, but now, as I mentioned earlier, we can't take for granted. It's very possible that communication links can be severed. It's very possible that communication can be different within different parts of the computational substrate. And now your distributed systems have to have some way of managing that. Uh, and you'll see there's a paper called Grapevine, um, that you'll see, which was a, a system done, uh, Xerox Park. You have a, a paper on that and communication is one of their, the big, uh, one of the biggest issues that they faced in developing this type of system. Uh, the third one is coordination. Uh, coordination is a, when you're, if you think about, if you want to um, do some kind of computation, how do you coordinate the different elements doing that computation? It could be a service too. So for example, um, if you're doing an email, ser uh, an email service, how do you coordinate all these servers uh, out on the internet? How do you coordinate updates to these different servers if, if you're doing something like DNS, which is a domain name service? Suppose you're, there's one server at one place and you do an update there, and in another place on the internet you do another update and they're inconsistent. All right, there's a big coordination issue. This type of coordination is, it becomes much more, much more exasperated when you have the communication issues too. Transparency. In some distributed systems, um, as defined earlier, you want to make it feel like the distributed system is really one. Uh, this is a way to reduce the complexity of programming the system. 
And so transparency is, is just that. How can you make the, the, uh, the fact that it's distributed transparent to the end user so that the end user can, have, can think about the system in a less, less complicated way and write programs more effectively? Naming. Naming is a, is a, is a huge issue. Um, there's, naming is, is in essence, um, indirection. So going, th things like DNS is a, is a big naming service on the internet going from photo.net to some IP address, 64.mumble, um, or being able to get what, to be able to figure out what services are out there and associating names with them so you can refer to them, so you can pass those references around. Load sharing. If you have all these, independent computational uh, proce uh, comp uh, processors around the, uh, the internet or in your, in, in your uh, distributed system, how do you effectively utilize all of those resources? I mean, the reason you want to have all these, probably one of them is you want more speed, like SETI, right? SETI wants a lot of speed. How do you make sure that you, that you put the right amount of computation on each processor? And you have to remember that, that um, if you don't do that, I mean, you can have, remember yesterday we talked about if you put too many processes on one particular server, what happens? Well, you, you can start thrashing, right? So you have to be aware of, of how to load share between your different uh, processors. Consistency. So if you have, if you have process, if you have state, computation state spread throughout the, uh, the whole uh, distributed system, how do you make sure that, that the data is consistent? So I mentioned earlier, what happens if you go to one server and you make one change, and you make an, go to another one and you make an inconsistent change? All right, then you have an inconsistent system, and that can happen, and it will happen, and so your system has to have some way of being able to manage, uh, being able to manage this inconsistency so that the people who use the system actually don't get hosed by that, and they see a consistent system. Failures can happen, you know, anytime, anywhere. Um, they're not necessarily ones you can control. Uh, you can have lightning strike. You can have people go into tunnels and cut fibers um, by accident, and you don't know when they're going to, how long. You can never predict how long a, fa a failure is going to last, a random failure is going to last. Security becomes even more important, as we've seen uh, on the Internet especially. We've had hackers um, come in and do a lot of denial-of-service type attacks. If you offer services on the network, some, you know, there's someone can come in and try to take, hijack that service. Someone can try to hijack your servers. Uh, because you don't have direct control over them, security becomes even more important. Heterogeneity really mixes all of this up. The big problem with, with uh, having all these different, this distributed system like, uh, like the internet, like an internet, is that you have machines of different types, of different capacities, having different policies of use, uh, and, and having different architectures. I mean, everything is, it can be different. And so you have to, your distributed system, the way you design it, has to take that into account. And the last one, which is becoming more prevalent, is mobility. So think about something like WAP. Right, you take you take your phone and it's web enabled, and you can go from one place to another. Or think about um, something like 802.11b, um, uh, which is this wireless. You guys have, have seen these airports, Apple airports, with these wireless cards. You use it. You use it. Well, and imagine t having a laptop where you take one of these around, not just in a building, but a, you know across the across the the U.S. Um, there's a lot of, now that a distributed system is become, are becoming more and more mobile. You can't as really assume that there's all that every computational resource exists in a specific location. So naming, what do we need to name? Well, there's a lot of different things that we need to name. There's processes, there's services, there's hosts, there's objects. If you're doing anything in object oriented as an object oriented system. Um, and there's groups of these things also. And what, if, when you think about naming, there's a process called binding. So binding is discovering and associating a name with one of these processes, services, hosts, objects, etc. You'll hear that term. Um, you'll read it in some of the papers. And when someone talks about the binding states, they usually mean uh, the two part, this, pro this discovery and, and association. And an example of that is DNS. Um, when you go out to the internet and you give a, an actual name to, to uh, your server, to your um, clients, your Netscape or your Internet Explorer, it has to go out and figure out what the IP address on the internet of that server is. 
And so it has to discover that, and it has to resolve that into an IP address, and then it can bind it and then go and, and grab some data from, from that server. Um, we're going to actually have a lecture on, on naming uh, next week. Uh, it's, it's important. There's lots of different reasons why you'd want to do that. And the, Nutella, did you guys, when you guys did that client, you probably had some naming issues there, right? Like, how did you, how did you do discovery of, of the, the servers out there? Everything was IP What's that? Everything is IP number and IP number. So how do you, but how do you get those I, that IP those IP numbers? There are services that provide lists of active. Right. And so how do they provide how do those services provide that? By doing the using the pong protocol the ping and the pong protocol. So, so there's a protocol there's so there's a, a sense of bind you have to go out and get those IP addresses somewhere from somewhere, right? And so that, that's, that's, again, discovery, and now your name happens to be this, IP, the thing that you get back is this IP address. Communication. This is one of the most difficult aspects. Um, so what makes communication difficult? Well, when you're communicating, the messages can have a lot of different characteristics. They can, there's a length, some are short, some are long. They can be priority. Uh, and there, there can also be um, streamed, uh, streamed or non-streamed. So let's think about the last two there. Um, priority. Well, why would you uh, you want to have one message have priority over another? And what? But why? Can you give like a concrete example, like a practical example of why someone would want to say, I want these packets to have priority over these other packets? 911.com. <laughs> so any type of emergency services um, over the internet. It's funny you mentioned that because the other day we were talking about um, uh, the earthquake in Seattle, and it turns out that uh, I have a friend who knows these guys at the U.S. Geological Survey out in California pretty well, and they have all these sensors all over the place, and they know they can they actually have up to like 30 seconds notice of when an earthquake's going to hit. And these alarms go off, and so they just, you know, get on. The, they're already in their safe place when these alarms go off. But wouldn't this be a great service on the internet, right? If you had your AIM client, and you know, you had this thing come and say, like, an earthquake's going to hit you in five, four, right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, wouldn't you rather get that than like your next three junk email, you know, spams or something like that? Well, you know, there's that's a that's a great example of a service that I I I'm, I would think would probably be is one that you would see coming up. What's another good example of, of priority? Let's just think about the type of system, why you would want to integrate priority into, your, into a system. Mm -hmm. I mean, video signals something that has to receive as a group, otherwise you can't view it. Good. So if you're getting, getting, uh, if you're getting email versus video, you probably would rather the, the email, for example, wait for, the, for you to get your, your next video. Mm -hmm. Or it could be exactly the other way around. You might, you might want to get the video, but it's going to clog your system up, so you just want it to, to be low. Good. You might, if you have, if you're in a low bandwidth connection, um, you might have that issue. So you might want to tweak the priority. Um, one other thing that you guys that that you may run into is uh, increasingly these days in businesses they have gold level customers, silver level customers, and bronze level customers, right? And wouldn't it be cool that if you were a gold level, you know, if you were the Amazon, you know, buy where you bought a book every day, wouldn't it be cool if Amazon gave your packets priority over over somebody else's? Right, and they could. There's ways that you can do that, um, both on the server side, but there's also with the new Internet 2 protocol. There's going to be ways that you can do that throughout the network. Um, streams. What are streams? What are streams? You've all heard of streams, video streams, right? What makes a stream a stream a set of streaming data different than a set of like email data or? or it's continuous, okay, it's sequential. What else? What's the typical thing that you, what do you do once you get the stream? Process. You, you process it, you act on it, you, you, you know, if it's a video stream, you put something up, and then what do you do with that data typically? Discard it. You typically just throw it away. Now, why do you just, why do you throw that away? You've already done whatever it is that you want to You've already seen it. Um, another thing is that a lot of times that data actually is very, it takes up a lot of space. So if you're getting this video, do you really want to store gigabytes of video on your, on your hard drive for all the video that you're watching or you're going to be watching? Probably not. So 
streams are, are um, have a very different set of characteristics than, than your typical um, packets that, that you, uh, communications that you send. Now, the, me the, the properties of the communication medium are going to affect the performance. So I don't know how, how many of these you guys have got into, but um, who can tell me the difference between bandwidth and latency? Have any of you heard those? Sure. Yeah. Have those somebody, somebody who? Yeah. Good. So the, uh, the analogy I like to use is one of pipes. If you think of the internet as this pipe, bandwidth is how what the radius of this pipe is, and latency is how long this pipe is from one end to the other. Okay. So if I'm doing video, what do I care about, bandwidth or latency? Bandwidth. bandwidth. If I'm getting if I'm getting streaming video, I care about bandwidth. If I'm trying to have a phone conversation over the internet, what do I care about? Latency. latency. Okay, why do I care about latency if I'm having a phone conversation, Greg? Uh, you, want, you want it to be sort of a real-time conversation. <laughs> 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 now, now I do, want, I do care about bandwidth at some point, but these days voice compression is pretty good. So uh, usually you can, you can actually have a reasonable conversation over a 56 uh, line. Well, it, would, you, would you consider the phone conversation to be not streamed since they come in little packets? And you want them all. I mean, I guess everything comes in little packets. Yeah. yeah, everything comes in packets, and you would actually, I would think of it as a stream because it's stuff that you're, I mean, there's no reason for you to want to store it or process it once you've heard it once. You know, process once, discard. Unless you are, you know, government or something and want to keep this stuff around. So with something like the video phone, then that's where you really want both. Right? That's right. That's right. And video phones, I mean, that's, that they've been trying to commercialize the, those things for, for so long. And the problem is a lot of network. I mean, it's hard to have both bandwidth, good bandwidth and good latency. Right. I mean, that's. But you can have, say, a real-time conversation, but delayed, like, video images, right? In other words, the, could the conversation be real-time, but as he's saying it, you're not actually saying yeah. it? And that's one of the optimizations, and you'll see that on on video, typical type of video uh, conferences. I mean, a lot of them these days have that. They they'll sacrifice the video, but they won't the audio, right. and they'll give it priority. They'll give the audio right. packets priority over the video packets, in that case. Um, multicast. Who's heard of multicast? Multicast. One source, multiple destinations. That's right. That's right. So why is why is multicast? How does that help us? What's, what's so good about multicast? Uh -huh. uh, if you can find a common pass segment, you don't have to generate as much traffic to go for that one pass segment. You just have one message. You just split it at the end. Right? Okay. Good. There's, um, there was a, uh, I, I, the, one of the, I, it was about, I don't know, six months ago, something like that. Do you guys remember this, uh, this, this big horrible uh, disaster that, that happened when, um, Victoria's Secret had their first runway, uh, the first show on the, uh, video, uh, uh the or they had, yeah, they had something live, like some show live. Yeah. What was, what, what, what problem, what was their problem? What was their disaster? Yeah, everyone logged in and it was super, super slow and choppy. No one, so, so why would that be? Well, how does, how does, how would this work? So what happens? You have the, the, the VS server here and then everybody starts coming in and asking for the same packets, right? And so this thing has to be sending out the same packets to a bunch of different people. What's, what would be a better solution? Send it out to one message to, to, I guess, other main servers and then have those main servers. All right. So multicast in this case. If you say if you have a, if you can have a multicast approach, then you send one stream out to make to make to different parts of the of the inter, different uh, big or the big routing uh, centers of the internet, and then that gets routed rerouted. But you're only sending one stream until you finally get to the last layer where you actually have to split, and so that reduces your bandwidth or latency. Bandwidth. Bandwidth, bandwidth requirements. Good. Um, it also Im improves your server performance. Um, and then message prioritization. How many of you guys have heard of this Internet 2, this new, um, this new research project that's going on? A couple people? Can, I can't tell you anything about it. Can't tell you anything about it. 
Um, well, one of the things, one of, the Internet 2 is supposed to be this new high, super high bandwidth, low latency network that's going to replace the Internet. Um, it's, there's a bunch of colleges now that are connected with, with this, uh, with new interconnects. I think they're all fiber, probably. Um, but one of the things that, that's, that people are talking about that this new Internet has as a part of it is message prioritization. Now, in the current protocols, there are ways to get message prioritization, um, but they're typically ignored or, or not, not followed. And this new Internet to message prioritization is supposed to be a big, something that's obeyed all the way through. Part of the reason they're doing that is because they want to be able to do things like this video, um, you know, data type, uh, video audio type differentiation, any kind of multimedia, all those types of streaming applications um, are things that could really benefit from message prioritization. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, like I said, we have, it's in there now, but, but it's really, if you try to use it, it's probably not going to work too well. Now, here's a big, here's a touchy issue, consistency. It's going to be the, one of the most difficult issues to, to deal with. And it's going to be, for example, in this Grapevine paper that you guys are reading, you really have to do a, you really have to understand how they, you, you should try to understand how they manage consistency. Um, now, the problem here is that network links can fail at any time. It can be intentional, it can be unintentional, but they will fail at some time. And we don't know how long they, they'll fail. And so typically what, what people do is they say, oh, this is easy. What we'll have is replication. And what we'll do is we'll replicate the data strategically throughout our distributed system. And that way, if it gets cut off, right, if something gets cut off, then the two pieces that are cut off uh, can, impl can, can keep going on without having to to worry about when this link comes back up. Uh, and people can replicate, you can replicate data. You can also replicate computation. If you send, you know, if you're SETI, you can probably send, you know, a couple, you can duplicate your comp computation in hopes that, to make sure that, you know, one computer at least will come back with the answer if you think that, that actual processors are gonna go down too. Now the problem with that is consistency. So what happens if these two, you know, these, is the, if there's a network failure and these two entities are, are dis, sub-distributed systems are, are, are operating independently? Um, now, consistency is also an issue even if there is a connection because there's propagation delay, right? So if, you, if you're on one side of the, of the Internet, uh, on one side of the coast, and, and, someone, and someone else is on the other side, and you try to update uh, some database with, with inconsistent uh, data, data that's inconsistent, you might be able to do it, especially if there's, a, if, the, if there's a network link that's been cut. So how do you resolve that? Um, well, replication, actually, there's lots of, there's lots of research um, behind how to do that using replication. One of the ways that's typically used is some kind of voting scheme or what kind of majority scheme. So what happens is the person who gets who, the, the system that has the most hosts that agree that this is the, 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 the right answer is the one that wins. Another one is a time-based scheme, which is the, the most uh, recent update is the one that wins. All of these different approaches have trade-offs, uh, and you'll be exploring some of those in the Grapevine uh, paper. Um, but in essence, once you have replication, one of the things that you start, the, one of the trade-offs is that you're going to have less effective resources. So if you're replicating data everywhere, then that's more disk space or more, or more storage that you have to use that can't be used for something else. If you're replicating computation, which, isn't, which is more rare, um, you're, you're getting less processing power overall. Uh, the, the trickiest thing here is how you manage extended failures. Uh, and tip, a lot of systems, I mean, assume that, that the failure isn't going to be for a long period of time, but you never know. Load sharing. Again, another active area of research. So the, the prob, what, what is load sharing? Has anyone heard that term before? If you're a study, for example, you want to, it'd be great if you could put, uh, if you could give more work to processors that, that could handle more, more work and less to those that can handle less. Uh, same for any other type of distributed system. Now, the question is, how do you do that? Um, well, one of the things that, you, that helps you is that at least you know that, lo that processors that are more local to you, so say in your local subnet or so on, it's, you can probably uh, predict that those are going to have less communication failures than those farther away from you. Um, that's, that, that could be interesting. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, but the, but if, if you can't depend on something like that, 
then you have to do something like migrate, being able to migrate processes around your distributed system. So suppose that, that you're running, suppose that you're, as an example, suppose that you have some distributed system like this, and you say, I want to be able to run some simulation on these. Well, what you could do is start all the processes running on one, and then have that one start distribute the processes, start migrating these processes to other places on the network. And this is, works really well if you have a divide and conquer algorithm, right? Because you could say, suppose you could divide something into three pieces. You could say, oh, um, I'll take one, and then I'll give one here, and then one here. And this one might say, oh, I'll take one, and then one piece of the computation, I'll, I'll send one here and send one here. And you can have that sort of propagate out and have local process migration uh, so that you can take an advantage of this locality that you know that you, you can predict that that processors closer to you um, are less like, you're less likely to have a communication failure than something that's many steps away from you. Um, but this process migration can be expensive. Uh, and what can be, what's, what's so expensive about process migration? It's not always expensive, but it can be. What, what, what's one of the reasons it might be expensive? So you don't have a lot of data that you have to replicate and ship. Right. You have data and potentially program, too. So if you have a lot of data, if you have a lot of program to, to ship, a lot of code to ship, then sending all this stuff over can be, I mean, if the, if the cost of sending all that stuff over is greater than the cost of you doing it yourself, of running the computation yourself, then why send it over to begin with? So what, oh, go, yeah, question. Some parts of the problem have to be combined all at once, and yet uh, one machine is much faster than the other. It's going to waste its cycles waiting for the next one. That's so right. Far. That's right. And that's why, and that's one of the problems you have with heterogeneity, right? You have some machines that can do, that can do the computation much faster. It'd be great if you knew which of those machines were and be able to send them more so that you could give them more of the load than the, than the other ones so you get all the data back at the same time. You don't waste a lot of, and that's, def, that's definitely one of the issues. Now, in addition to that issue, there's Turing completeness. You guys know what Turing completeness is, uh, right? No. no? Oh, you guys haven't? It's mentioned it many, many times, yeah. but we haven't actually have that in May. Okay, well, um, um, so, here, here's one of the, if you have, each of these machines is what's, what you can refer to as a Turing complete machine. So that means it can, op, it can do any type of computation that any other machine can do. Um, now, one of the, one of the, if you have, an, if you have one of these, if you model any of these as a Turing machine, then you have what's called the halting problem. Have you guys heard of the halting problem? Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the halting problem? There's, you can't build a, program that knows when it's going to stop. Or when they, <laughs> it's yeah. something I, I'm not like, doing very well at articulating it, but... Um, you got the general idea. You can't build a program that can tell you when another program is going to stop, yeah. right? So if, suppose that the program, suppose that the computation that you're sending out is one where you don't, where, that has this property that you don't know when it's actually going to, going to stop. How do you know what, even if you know that this processor over here is 10 times faster than this one, how do you know that the piece of computation you send to one of them is actually going to, is actually going <laughs> to finish before the, the one that you send to another one? You don't. That's right. If it's very, it's a very regular thing. I mean, something like the SETI where you're just running a set of fixed computations, right? There, that you can, you don't need a, a Turing complete machine to do that. You just, you can even probably use some kind of, you know, modified state machine. And so you actually have a good idea of how, how, how long it's going to take. At least your predictions can be pretty, uh, pretty good if you know what the resulting hardware is and what the load is. Um, but if it's something like, you know, compute the, uh, I mean, imagine, imagine, um, Something that just uh, that just goes off and compiles a program. You're doing a big distributed compilation, right? You don't know when it's necessarily going to stop. Or what pieces of code are going to be harder to compile than other pieces? Um, and so the other one other issue is propagation delay. And let me, as an example, let me show you why that's an issue. Suppose that you had that you actually had a computation that was well behaved, so that you could predict, you know, what how long it was going to run on one machine versus another. And that you did have some idea, and this is a lot of ifs, uh, 
you did have some idea of how powerful these machines were. Well, the last piece of information you need to know to distribute the load well is how loaded the machines were right now at any point in time. Uh, if you have in a small network, that might not be so difficult. But if you have a large network that spans you know, the Internet, what kinds of issues can you get to there trying to coordinate that? So the machine says, I'm not busy, and then someone gets inundated from 100 friends with peers who work. Yep. So some machine way over here says, Oh, I just came up, you know, I'm a, I'm a really fast, I'm a multi-processor, mumble, really, really fast machine. And what's going to happen? Well, everyone around it's going to start sending lots of work to it. But while they're doing that, this message is coming, is still propagating over to the other side of the network. And by the time the other side of the network, you know, all of a sudden the whole network's sending everything to this machine. And now it sends a message saying, stop, 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 you know, don't send me anything. And so everybody stops, and then all of a sudden it has nothing to do, right? So you can imagine getting into these weird oscillations where you're, you're basically spending all your time batting off packets or telling or waiting for, for packets. Um, so if you th this kind of approach, which which some people you know initially uh, proposed, works much better when you when it's a local system where you have a lot of control. A friend of mine actually did a project at Xerox Park around this. Uh, his name is Carl Waltzberger. And he had this great idea, which is that you treat all of these as as uh, the way that the way that you assign um, the load is everybody has money, so to speak, and you do some kind of bidding for these resources. And he did a, actually a whole thesis on this, and uh, is is quite nice. Um, if you guys are interested, I can point you to it. But it, it, the, the re one really nice thing about reading something like that is it gives you a good sense of what all these issues are and how he went off and batted down a whole bunch of them. He's a great, great guy, really smart. And let's start off by talking about um, remote procedure call. How many of you guys have heard of remote procedure call? A couple. There's, this was a, a notion that was introduced um, at Xerox Park uh, about 15 years, 16 years ago. And what it does is, is, is it is so everyone knows what procedure call is, right? You call some something else. Remote procedure, procedure call (RPC) just abstracts the, the notion of where a computation runs. So the idea there is, when you call something, normally you know that it's or you have some idea that it's going to run locally. Under RPC, you, it actually may run anywhere in a, on the network, and you'll get your answer back. Uh, to foo, just as if you had run a normal procedure call. So let's think about that. Now that now that you're, we're doing remote procedure call, the standard semantics of procedure call, there's a lot of assumptions built in that we can't have built in anymore. What's the key one that we can't assume anymore? What 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 do you always expect to happen when you call some procedure? It that it comes back, it comes back. right? Can we just assume that anymore? Can't assume that anymore. So the computation can fail. And there's different ways that it can fail. Uh, and some of them you may be predictable in advance. Some of them may not. But now, in this, when you call a procedure, you have to, have so, you, you have to be able to have some way of, of specifying what happens if this procedure doesn't return. Uh, so what's, what's one way? Can anyone give me an example that we could change the, uh, the, a procedure call by adding some other, let's say we add another argument that, that helps us control this. What, what, would you, what, kind of, what kind of argument would that be and what would the semantics be of the resulting procedure call? Let's take a guess. OK, timeout. OK, and so what, how would that work? Good. So one thing you could do is to say, well, let's make, I'm just using scheme syntax here, let's make the first argument here be a timeout value. Seconds or whatever whatever you want. Um, the, but, the, but the point here is that you want, the semantics are now, if you wait for more than this amount of time, then you generate an exception or do something, in, depending on the programming language, that allows you to know that this procedure or this procedure call failed. Now, at that point, what are your choices? What can you do if that procedure call fails? Retry. You can retry. You can you can call it again. What else can you do? Give up. <laughs> <laughs> you can give up. You can try to run it locally. If you if if the reason you were sending it off was because you know, someone else you had um you it was a tough computation to do. Well. 
you're not going to get it from anywhere else, you might as well do it yourself. There's a couple options. You can have lot, you can do whatever you want, but those are the two typical types of things you might want to do. Um, there's this notion of blocking versus non-blocking. And what is that? Has, has anyone heard of this before? It's whether we stop and sit around and wait for the response to come back or carry on with our business. That's right. So one other thing you can do is you can say, well, when I run this command, when I run this, RP, this procedure called foo, am I going to immediately, am I just going to stop and, and wait and the whole everything just kind of halts until that the answer comes back or not, depending on the timeout, or am I just going to immediately go ahead and then later on when the answer comes up, it'll just, you, you know, then, then I can deal with it then. Now, one way that, that one way to implement this is um, imagine that the result of this foo isn't needed until later on in the computation. You could say, well, this is non-blocking, and then what happens is the computation will just continue until the point that it actually needs the result of this, and then it could decide what to do at that point. Mm. Right? So that way you can actually run two things in parallel. And uh, I mean, there's uh, there's some even in Scheme. There's actually versions of Scheme that do something like like this type like this. Um, the semant some of the semantics you could have. You might not decide you don't want timeouts, and what you have are uh, non-blocking calls, and then when you make these procedure calls, it just runs, 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 and it just waits, and then when it gets the result, it keeps going, and then it waits for the next one, and so on. That's one way to get concurrency without having to deal with a lot of the of the issues around concurrency. There are still some trade-offs to be made there. Um, now, just very quickly, what would there be? Do you guys think there would be any cases where you would be non-blocking, and, uh, and but it wouldn't matter if the answer never came back? Yeah, that, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. So if if some if there was some suppose you're getting some input from a user, right, and the user hit you know commit you know connect or, or, or click to do something, and then so you're going off to do something, and then later on the user hit cancel, right? You would just you would never need it. There, there's a lot of different, but there's a, there's others that you you might be able to think of, but there is both of these um, blocking versus non-blocking that's an important distinction that you have to make and you have to when you're looking at an RPC you have to understand whether RP, the RPC you're using supports that another one is synchronous versus asynchronous now we talked about what the Yesterday about synchronous, synchronous and asynchronous. What, what's an asynchronous type of event? Keyboard input. Keyboard input, getting packets, right? What's what's and so what's the opposite of that? See, something that's clocked or something that that you're that you're definitely going to get back, right? So, um, for RPC, you can have event-driven types of RPCs also. So this this gets back to the notion of you know, imagine that you're calling something that you say, foo, you know, f this thing goes off and, and has to wait for some asynchronous event, right? That might be something where you're not sure if it's ever, you know, ever going to come back or not. Um, and as opposed to something where you want, where you, ha you need to know the answer in order to continue the computation. This here is, is a little, overlaps a little bit with this notion here. But I just bring this up because there are some, some pieces out there in the literature where you have, this is this is what they they, they call their their um, distinction. This here, asynchronous versus asynchronous, has um, usually used more in real time type systems. Um, this last piece here is, is actually quite important. So this is the notion of let me see at least once, at most once, and exactly once. The question here is, when you run, when you call, when you do an RPC on foo, what happens? What, what, what can you guarantee happens on the other side? At least once semantics means that the system, what the system will do, the distributed system will say, okay, I'm going to run this, I'm going to run foo, and I'm going to, and I'm going to guarantee that that at least one invocation of foo is going to is going to occur. 
So you might want to do that, for example, if you have a very unreliable network, you might send you know, send it off to two different computers, or you might send it off to one and there's a timeout, and then you, you come back and you send it off to another. Um, and that means that, that you might have actually more than one actual completion of this, of this computation. Um, so when would you want to have at least one semantics? When you've got a complicated computation that has to be done, but all you care about is the answer, and you're just going to take the answer if it comes back and use it. Right. So if you're doing something where you're like a mathematical simulation or something where there's you know, just a straightforward type of computation, uh, definitely is, you know, at least once uh, is, is perfectly fine. When wouldn't you want to do at least once? When it alters data. Yeah, when it alters, when it alters data, so when you have side effects. So think about your ATM machine, right? If you hit the ATM withdraw button, and it says, and it and it does an RPC out to to register that with your bank. You probably don't want at least one semantics on that, unless because you could have lots of uh, of uh, withdrawals registered, even though you get money once out of the machine. What about at most once semantics? What do you can now that we know what at least once is? What's what do you think at most once is? Well, I don't see the use for it, but mm -hmm. I'm going to send out a single request. That's it. So with side effects, we would send out at most once. But this is at most one, one, one attempt or most? Well, most once execution. So we actually have to avoid a timeout. If there's a timeout, we'll send out another RPC well, because we didn't succeed. Well, you have to be a little bit careful because when you have a timeout, unless you know why the timeout happened, yep. if you send out another one, you might get mm -hmm. at least one semantics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because imagine that you send off, imagine you send off a call mm -hmm. and then the network, you know, someone cuts the line, some guy in, a, in some manhole cuts a, cuts a line. And so this line, your network connection may be severed to that part of the network for hours. And so then you send something off somewhere else. In the meantime, both of these might have succeeded, right? If you know that the timeout, ha or if you know that the timeout happened because of the actual computer on the other side, you know, wasn't, it was down, then that's okay. But it's usually, usually you wouldn't, you would get something back Instead of having instead of having the timeout exception, if that was the case. So the distinction between at most once and exactly once is a business letter comes to you and it says return if not a deliverable to the addressee. Yeah. You'll, you'll take over. Yeah. I mean, there, there's all sorts of things you can do with acknowledgments to try to to try to know whether the per, the machine on the other side got it. There's always some some room for you know for failure, but in general, you you can make some assumptions that are pretty safe about about timeout and getting acknowledgments back. But the key here is the difference between these two is that in this case, if you have at least one semantics, then they can be one or more invocations of that procedure. If you have at most once, then either you had either zero invocations or one, but you don't, you don't have any more. And then the third one is exactly once, which is there's you know that this thing's going to happen and it's going to it's going to happen at some point, but it's not going to happen zero times. It's not going to happen more than once times. It's going to happen exactly once. Um, anything that modifies uh, state type data. Why would it be all right for it to run zero times? I can understand exactly once, but zero times doesn't seem to make sense. Well, zero times, is, one of the cases is that after you try to run it, if the result of running it doesn't matter. So suppose one of the things you wanted to do was to send out, uh, like think about streaming. Right? Remember, with streaming, if you, don't get a, if you don't get some packet, then <coughs> And then at, you know, at the right time, then what use is it at that point? So think about the things that you would want to use for at most once. Think about things that aren't going to matter after some amount of time. And at that, but that if you do do it twice, I mean, you might get. Imagine you get all this jitter, and because you're sending lots of, lots, you're processing, you know, all this this uh, voice data, or this video data, right? You don't want to be sending lots of frames. Um, if you're using a, a multi, uh, some kind of distributed system to do all the video processing for you, so that's that's a kind of thing. Any time where you, where you just the, the time value of the data is a good example um, of that. And exactly once is probably more like your ATM, right? Where you if you take if the ATM gives you the money, you want exactly once type of semantics if you're doing RPC between the ATM and the server that's that's managing that particular bank's ATMs. Or the system. 
could work, right? I mean, it, it would be okay if it told you I couldn't, we couldn't do that transaction, but no money gets deducted, right? I mean, it's on the ATM. If it oh. says sorry, couldn't do it, try again later. As long as no money is deducted, that's not such a terrible thing. Yeah, though. The only terrible thing happens when it deducts more than one. Well, the, the interesting thing about that is that is you, customers get very upset when they go to the ATM and they don't get any money. So typically the way one of the – there's actually some, some interesting papers around these, um, how these ATMs work. What they'll do is if, you, if you're authenticated, because they take a picture of you and everything, if they, for some reason the link goes down, which it can, they'll actually give you the money and then try to do it and then try to run the transaction later. Assume because it, they assume that most of the time it won't be a, a you know crook there uh, taking this money, um, and that way the customer doesn't get upset. And so, in terms of retaining like the customer service costs and retaining the customer, I guess it ends up working out for them. Um, so this is you know, <laughs> if you want to rob an ATM machine, right? Cut the link and. <laughs> is there a way to do an exactly one where you actually send out the RPC to multiple to multiple servers? But then somehow there's communication so that if well, as soon as one of them succeeds, the rest of them give up? Or, or does it necessarily mean that you only send it out to one person at a time with at most ones? Uh, with, at most, with at most ones? Yeah. Um, you typically, in all of these, you typically just send it out once. Uh, and that's because you don't, if everyone was sending out multiple requests, I mean, once at a time, you said, what you'll do is you'll send it out once, and then if you get a timeout, then that's that's when you have to decide what you do. So if you get, for example, in at least once, if you get a timeout, it's always okay to send out another request. What you don't want to do is just keep sending out a whole bunch and then wait for something because if everybody does that, then the whole then then you've effectively reduced your 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 overall processing power very quickly. So one of the assumptions that this that RPC makes is a client server type of of framework. Um, and the RPC infrastructure has to implement a bunch of different pieces of it. So let's see what that actually looks like. So at one side here, you have a server. At one side, you have a client. And then you typically have some kind of uh, discovery server somewhere out here. So what happens first? Well, the first thing that happens is the client needs to figure out who, if it wants to do this RPC, what kind of wh where these servers are out there that it could send this to. So there's some communication that goes back and forth here, uh, and the client will say, "I'm looking for a service that computes, you know, extra trust, you know, SETI type things, or I'm looking for a Kerberos type server uh, for authentication, whatever that might be." Now, once the client has that, it knows how to address this server. So it makes a call, and at that point, when it makes the call, this is all on the on the client side. Let's put the network here. Um, when you when it makes the call, it does what's called marshalling. To the uh, the arguments of the call and marshalling means taking these arguments and turning them or packaging them into something that can be sent that can be sent over the network and recognized by the server. So uh, once once we get then then we can go through the network, find our way over to the server, where you do unmarshalling. The server then gets this request processes it, and then you have on the return trip the same type of thing. You have your marshalling through the network, unmarshalling, and then a return. Now, why do we need marshalling? Well, different computers store their data different ways at all different levels. So, for example, if you have a 32-bit um, a number, do you put the bytes, do you order the bytes where the, the most significant byte first or the most significant byte last? 
thing, issues like that. If you have integers, on some computers, integers can be 64 bits, on some they can be 32 bits. And there's all sorts of reasons that data might not be the same here, represented here, as it is over here. And so you have this marshalling step uh, that helps you out. Uh, is, mm -hmm. is that some kind of sort of common, common syntax that everyone has agreed upon to use? Or? That's right. That's right. It is. Everyone who's in the system has to agree to the same type, the same schema, or the same way of marshalling and unmarshalling. And you have to decide what types of arguments can be marshaled and what they, how they're represented. All of that has to be very well defined. Uh, and you'll see, I mean, in any, I mean, if you look at Microsoft.net, which is the most, you know, uh, the, the, the newest, naziest version of RPC, um, You'll see, you'll see that they have a lot, they do a lot of work in this marshalling because they do things like in, in Microsoft.net, you can have lots of different languages. You can have these, these, uh, these servers, the services written in a variety of different languages, Scheme, um, C Sharp. I mean, the idea is anything, Java, anything goes. I don't know if Java, um, because it's Microsoft. But, um, and so, and the client here, uh, has to be able to marshal things and, and they have to be unmarshaled back and forth regardless of what language is being used over here. What's the role of the discovery server again? The role of the discovery server, server is for you, uh, the service here, is for you to figure out what server out there provides the service you're looking for. So if you say, I want a Kerberos server, well, if you figure out, if you know what it is today, tomorrow it might not be up. It might be, or there might be some, you know, maybe that one had a bug and they shut it down and someone else brought another, a different one up. Maybe there's one closer to you. Yes. So that server has to already be registered somehow in the discovery server. Yep, yep. So that actually, what a, when a server, and actually we're going to get to that, that piece of it also is the, is the whole registration. But this is just here. This is the general, generic, how RPC works through the network. Um, now, there's one other, there's a couple other pieces of this. Uh, you really want some kind of support to be able to do all this work for you. So typically this is done by the compiler or the linker. And there, what, what happens is that this, this step here, all of this, or all of this actually, all of this is work is done by a component called the stub, which is generated by your compiler or your linker. And the stub, what it does is when a client does a procedure call, there, there'll be a, for if it's, if this can be, if this is a registered remote, something that can be done remotely, the compiler or linker can generate some code that makes it look to the client, to the pro, to the process that, or thread that's running as if this is just a regular call. Um, and depending on, it might integrate a, a variety of the semantics we talked about before, but that depends on your, how you design this. Um, but, it try, but what it does is it implements all of this. It just implements the discovery aspect of it. It implements the marshalling. It implements the unmarshalling. Uh, and, and so that, that way, when you're writing these things, it just makes it a bit easier to use. I also make sure that um, it, some of them handle some concurrency issues uh, that, that you might have uh, when you're calling back, when you're doing the RPCs. Now, RPC is, uh, is used by NFS and AFS, which is the Android file system, but X doesn't use it. So there's lots of different ways that you can do distributed computation. This is one that's common, but there can be there are many there are many others that people have tried. So getting back to this part down here, anytime a server comes up or or if it goes down gracefully, um, it has to interact with some kind of discovery service. And typically there's discovery servers which around the, the internet or around the network that you're dealing with. And um, what they do is each server uh, has some, some, some list of services that it provides. And typically these, these services consist of two parts. One is um, the name of that service and the version. And the name, I mean, these are typically integers. And what it does, the server will take this and go out and hand it off to the, the nearest discovery server. And then that discovery server can propagate that to other discovery servers. Now, one question is, what, when, when, if, you, if you think about that a little bit, you'll notice that, well, how does the server discover the discovery service to begin with, <laughs> right? 
and at some level, what ends up having to happen is that something has to be hard-coded in, or there has to be some protocol for doing that. Like, for example, you send out some message out saying, I'm looking for a discovery service in some, you know, just as a, as a broad, broadly, uh, like a multicast message or something like that. Um, there's an, an example of this type of thing is, um, is uh, when you're, what, how many of you guys, um, when you, have you guys done any sort of, uh, of home networking? Do you guys have any home networks? or Who has networking experience here? Anybody? Has anybody done? Okay. He, who does? Okay. Um, so one of the things that there's um, one of the things that you can when you're doing networking. Let's say you have a little a little network set up. You need to figure out um, what's my IP address, right? And you can have st IP addresses that are st static that you just build in, or you can have dynamic IP addresses. And so if you have dynamic IP addresses, it means anytime you need an IP address, you wake up and you say, okay, there's some server out there that'll give me an IP address that's handing these out, and I need for it to give me one. Right? But the question is, how can you know what that server is and how can you contact it if you don't even have an IP address? So that's an example of where there's a, a protocol, there's a way where you send something out and the, the, in a way that you can communicate back, and that is very something specific that that IP address server will see and say, oh, okay, here's your IP address. Um, if you, oh, you guys, you guys are running uh, Linux, okay. Um, okay, now one issue here, once these servers are registered with the discovery service, there's some issues here. When, when you're a client and you go to a discovery server and ask for what server provides a particular service, one of the, thing, one of the questions is, well, what, which of the servers that are out there do you want to return as the one that you should use? And so the, the issue there is, again, load, share, uh, load balancing. You want to be able to have to balance the load out. And so these, the, these discovery servers can actually help to balance the load amongst different machines by, return, by deciding which server to return back that you can use to, res to, uh, to respond to a particular service that you want to use. So let's talk a little bit about marshalling. Marshalling is important because it's the way that we get data back and forth. Uh, and as we spoke about before, you have to assume that there's a heterogeneous environment, which means that these servers on the other side are going to be representing data in quite a different number of ways. Uh, they could have, uh, even at the very lowest level, at the processor level, they could be representing data very differently than the client does. The thing that you can get out of making the data actually match closely from here to here is that the less work you have to do in marshalling and in marshalling, the faster your, your RPC will be. Um, so typically what you get when you see one of these specs, one of these marshalling specs, is you'll see something like a common representation, which will say here's a set of data types. So you can have integers, maybe different types of integers. You can have floating point numbers. You can have uh, arrays, say, of data. Um, you can have structs, maybe some more complicated aggregates, a bunch of different types. And then on the other side of this, you'll have a representation. And one type of representation is to just say, well, if we have, say, 16 different data types, you could have a tag that, that tells you for each of these, that tells you 0, 1, 2, all the way down, that tells you what the data type is. And then on the other side of this, you'll have something that, that's a representation. And it'll say, for example, for a float, for a floating point number, here's how you represent it. You have to, you know, you have to represent it in 64 bits. The first, you know, few bits are uh, this part. The second few bits are this part. This is the exponent and so on. And so this is what, when you read these things, when you read these specifications, they'll, this is sort of, this is this will be the meat of that. Now, one question is, what do we do about pointers? So, pointer, you know, points to somewhere in a, in your processes address space. So you can have a pointer in the client here that points to some place in memory. What do you do about pointers? Do you want to send those around? Maybe, maybe not. But in general, what's the hard part about sending a pointer? What happens if I do send a pointer and I have something over here? Let's let's just hypothesize. Let's say I had something that was a pointer and I just, you know, said it's 32 bits, 32 bits of of memory plus some process ID. 
What happens if I send that over to the to the other side? It's useless without the server then communicating back to the client to get whatever's there. And, um, right. So why would you send the pointer? What what what's the use of a pointer? You want to dereference it, right? What happens when you do? How do you dereference this pointer and figure out what it's pointing to? You have to go back, right? So why not send the thing that you're pointing to in the first place over there, right? So it's it's and, I, and so that I mean, you gen, uh, from that sense, you probably don't want to be sending pointers over. There are times when you do want to be sending pointers over, and it's okay. Can you give me an example of that? If it doesn't actually need to access it, but it might need to be a pointer arithmetic to when it returns whatever it returns, we'll have to access. Yeah. So so maybe like in C, if you're if all you're doing is pointer arithmetic, you can kind of fudge the pointer as a as an integer and send it over. And if there's no dereferencing, then it might be okay. Um, another example is imagine that the thing you're pointing to is actually something not necessarily that's here, but that's in some. Let's suppose that there's some other big object repository. So in the virtual memory for object-oriented systems, they talk about these object-oriented systems. There's a lot of, of research that's actually be, been done on having these gigantic, replicated, available object repositories spread around. If you're sending pointers into these that reference objects, then, well, the, this thing is supposed to be distributed and available, et cetera. So if you send a pointer of, to one of those, then it might not be so bad to do that because then you can just reference it here. In fact, the server might even have a local copy or could cache a local copy. So you have to be very careful with pointers, um, but there are times when, they're, when, they're, when it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, and there are times when it actually makes a lot of sense. So Luis, do, hmm? do you determine locally then whether or not to make a, a remote procedure call just based on sort of the, the overhead of sending all of your your argument data out versus whether it's faster just to do something locally? Yeah, that's something if you're, if, for example, if you're doing a big computation and you're, one, of your, uh, one of your objectives is performance, then you'll have to take that into consideration. If you want to send, the cost of sending that out shouldn't be greater than the cost of doing it yourself. And if the thing that you're sending out is this big hunkin array, Right, then you, that other that server better be doing a lot of, of work on that array, or else you might as well just do it locally. Now, one thing that can happen is you, you can get exceptions, and when you have when you do this call, you might get back if a, exceptions. One of them might be a timeout. One of them might be uh, an anticipated failure. Um, there, so you might get a network type fail, type of exception. There's all sorts of different types of things that can that can hit you. Um, and how that's handled depends on your system. And some of them, these stubs handle them, and there's always just like a fail message that comes back. Sometimes you might actually want to get a little bit deeper into the details of what actually happened so that you can try to, to, uh, to fix it uh, yourself in, within the program. Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about, about this type, uh, about RPC, I want to uh, close up talking about end-to-end -end design. Um, this is a, a, a debate that actually <laughs> started off a while ago and is still going on. And it's one of these key debates that's very good to, to understand because it'll, it'll permeate any kind of system design that you do. How this, this first idea, this end-to-end -end design idea first came up. So when they were building, when trying to decide what, to, what kind of protocol to use on the internet, um, remember back in those days, what did people do with the internet? Well, typically they would log on somewhere. That's what you used it for. You'd log on to your machine here, your server there, your server there. You might do a little bit of FTP, but there was a lot. Of, most of the users used it in some form or other for these sessions. So the idea of a session, if you imagine trying to build the idea of a session into the internet infrastructure itself, what would that mean? Well, a session is is a lot like a a virtual a virtual circuit, like the phone company does, right? It just opens up a dedicated line, connects the two together, and then you just go from there. They, and what's great about that is that once you have that line, you know that you have a certain amount of bandwidth. You know that you can the performance characteristics become a bit more a bit better defined. Um, 
and uh, and you and you so if if there if you don't have for example if you don't have enough bandwidth or if there isn't enough capacity you'll get a busy signal type of, just you know, like the phone so imagine if you try to build that type of thing into the internet where every time you made a connection you ended up creating in essence a virtual circuit like like the phone companies do when they connect two parties together um, why would you want to do that. Well, one of the arguments being proposed at that time was, well, everybody uses, everybody does it for this, and everyone's always going to want to do it for that, and it's expensive to implement, and, and software, you know, you can come up with a bunch of other reasons why they might come say that, but they basically wanted that, that at the lower la layers of the Internet. Some other folks on the other side, um, and you'll read one of their papers, said, said um, had a different idea. They had this end-to-end -end argument, which is that, these functions that you want, like sessions and flows or whatever else might be, most of them can actually be built on, on top, layered up on top at the ends where they're being used. So for, there's no reason why if you had a very simple lowest layer that just did, say, packets, that you couldn't at, what, at the server side and at the client side create the notion of virtual circuits and then have some kind of implementation on top of these simple, simple unreliable packets. The, thing, the, the reason you'd want to do that is because you don't know what the network's going to be used for later on. What happens if, for some reason, people stop using it for sessions and start using it for something like HTTP, which they, had, they didn't know about back then? Do you, would you, what would happen to the performance of the Internet if every time you made an HTTP connection, that was supposed to be a virtual connection like on the phone? If you managed to get a connection, the phone would be great. If you managed to get a connection. <laughs> Yeah, but ima and, and yes, but imagine each, I mean, when you get a, a page, when you get download an age, uh, page, I mean, some of these go off and, you know, they talk to double click, they talk to a bunch of different servers. So, I mean, th think of it another way. When you dial a phone number, how long does it take for you to actually get connected? Is it, is it a millisecond or is it more like a second? It's a little bit longer, right? Imagine if every one of those times you, you know, you went off and you had to get a URL from somewhere else. It took that long just to set something, just so that you could download a little, you know, a tiny little gift from somewhere. Be horrible. Um, so, um, so what the argument here for end-to-end -end design is, is try to keep the 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 middle part, the substrate that you're building, as simple as possible, and only build up functionality at the ends where you actually need it. This will give you more flexibility, and it'll leave the intermediate pieces uh, available for, for better performance, better optimizations. Um, there's a paper you'll have to read about this. I'm just bringing it up in lecture because it's just a very fundamental uh, design concept uh, that's helped us greatly in terms of being able to scale out the Internet. And, uh, and I, I th you, this is one of those papers you guys should really um, enjoy but also try to get a lot out of. You said, you said the the question about end-to-end -end design was sort of an ongoing debate, although it certainly looks like for, for the web, at least, that end-to-end -end design is clearly you know, the way to go. So what, what is the ongoing? There's the internet, too. <laughs> I mean, there's, um, there, there's that, that's, that's the other thing is, you know, the, the argument is resurfaced with internet, too, is what kind of functionality do you want to build into that? Do you want to build in streaming capabilities? Well, that'd be great because then you could stream, you know, voice and multimedia, but is that what we're going to be using it for in, you know, 20 years? I don't know. You know, 20 years ago, people thought there's everyone was going to be using sessions. That was going to be the majority, and everyone was completely convinced. And we're, I could be, you know, I'm pretty convinced right now that we are going to be using multimedia in 20 years. But who knows? Cool. Yes. So this big, the whole things like cookies and stuff like that are a huge commercial impetus to try and mimic state on the web because you know, if you're Amazon, you want a cookie to, so that you can immediately plug into someone's previous history shove the books that you think they're most likely to buy at them, give them papers, recommend all that kind of mimicking state in, in yeah, I mean the other argument is if even imagine even let's let's suppose that everyone are everyone just universally agreed that we were going to be using streaming um, in 20 years. Even then, the problem is that if you build that streaming into the into the lower layers of of the of the internet too, then there's going to be some kind of cost associated with people who want to use that for a, a purpose other than streaming. You can imagine there being some other. You know, maybe there's some other services where all the streaming overhead causes, hu you know, a huge performance hit, and all of a sudden those services become less attractive, and, you know, and, and that's all because end-to-end, -end, because they didn't follow the end-to-end -end design.
And it's a huge debate. I mean, there's all sorts of money to be made if, if everybody agrees to put cookies and streaming and everyone's favorite stuff directly, because that means less implementation overhead for a lot of you know, all these commercial reasons. But from a practical point of view or forward-looking point of view, it's, it's a very different uh, uh, decision. Other questions? Okay. Oh.